We are living in technological systems. We are no longer, it has been a long history, that we are no longer in an atelier where we work with simple tools. No, we live in a technological system, uh, and um, that's the new condition that we are in now. There is a difference between the cybernetic machine and the autonomous, uh, the automatic machine that Marx described in the 19th century uh, in, in, in Manchester, in those factories. Uh, um, that is machines isolated, closed, automatic machine were considered to be one of the sources of alienation you know, because the human has to alienate itself, himself by firstly losing uh, his or her knowledge and secondly subordinating the body to the machines. Now this kind of machine still exists today but less and less because most of the machines are fully automatized. Many of the, because with the advancement of technology that the situation described by Marx as, uh, you know, specifically in the factories um, is fading away in history. But at the same time, we are living with uh, cybernetic machines. A cybernetic machine is different from an automatic uh, the machine of Marx's time in the sense that it is capable of self-regulation of self-improvement that is reflected in today's neural network, that is reflected in today's artificial intelligence, for example. So now we are living uh, with new kind of machines, and we need to analyze, for example, uh, a new political economy. Uh, and here, I think the, the, the work of uh, uh, Stigler is very relevant uh, because he has a book called uh, for a new critique of political economy, which deal a lot with uh, uh, the problem of consumerism and so on. But much more has to be done to analyze the situation that we are, the technological condition that we are living in, the new kind of machines. I think with te uh, digital technology and its problems today, uh, we have to, of course, to have a concrete understanding of the transformation of capitalism and uh, the kind of alienation, how the, uh, the, we have to understand the source of, of, of alienation. Uh, for me, it's less, much less than uh, this, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the obsoleteness of the, uh, of the um, how does it, the uh, analogous uh, tools that you are talking about. But more fundamentally, you know, the, the, the development of capitalism, the appropriation, uh, the capital's appropriation of the digital technology, and also our, our, our incapability to produce alternatives, uh, to resist a certain form of homogenization, um, and also the manipulation of consumerism. On my uh, part, I try to analyze a shift from what I called um, uh, the organized inorganic towards the organizing inorganic in the sense that in the past uh, those tools that we use such as hammer, such as uh, screwdriver, these are uh, organized inorganic. Even the flint we use to produce fire, you know, millions of years ago, these are called organized inorganic because they are inorganic inorganic material, such as the camera we are using, these are inorganic material, but we organize in the way to incorporate them into our body. But now we are living in what I call organizing inorganic. That this inorganic are uh, becoming, uh, they acquire organizing power because they are capable of auto-regulation, auto-improvement, and because of the right of the of the computer network, that they are able to form gigantic systems in which we are now living. It seems like we live in the time of science fiction. So. We talk we talk a lot about AI domination. We're talking about mass uh, unemployment. We talk about uh, 
And of course, uh, and more and more people trying to understand our future through science fiction. And uh, I found this really uh, disturbing. Uh, that today we rely on science fiction writers to tell us what our future should look like. Um, in many uh, schools, especially our schools, for example, there are many workshops about uh, science fiction uh, and how we can know our future through science fiction. Now, I'm not against science fiction. I read science fiction. Uh, I'm a big fan of science fiction myself. But um, I found this, as I said, I found this uh, problematic because that also means that we fail to analyze our concrete situation. This kind of narratives is ready to hand for the Silicon Valley um, uh, companies to just to uh, claim that you know now we have uh, uh, we are going to have an AI who is going to make everyone uh, jobless and uh, let's slow down. You know, Elon Musk has been talking about AI slow down for a couple of years. And last year, he proposed uh, and he signed with many uh, AI scientists to have a break for six months. But after that, he said, OK, I'm going to develop my own version of AI, uh, of chat GPT, that is more accurate. Uh, but so wh wh why do you need a break? Uh, you can do it without having a break. You know? Uh, so there is a certain kind of uh, which I call the self prophecy, the self prophecy of the industry. That means they're trying to claim that um, uh, there is going to be mass unemployment, but at the same time they are inventing machines to replace human beings. Yeah? So they anticipate what they are doing by producing exactly the same kind of technology for meeting no diversity or. Uh, Cosmotechnics or multiple cosmotechnics for me is that the reason for which I propose this agenda or this uh, is for me actually uh, I wouldn't say it's a uh, I would rather say that it is a philosophical project. Uh, it's firstly uh, it's based on two uh, premises. Firstly, is that there is an intimacy between philosophy and technology. Yeah, I'm working on the centrality of technology in the history of philosophy and in philosophical thinking itself. So firstly, we have to understand that technology is constitutive in uh, philosophical thinking. So the second premise is that uh, uh, given that uh, there have been different, um, that concepts are um, parts of the consideration of thinking, uh, the concept of technology, the concept of nature, uh, they, uh, they are different, they are different in different systems of thinking. You know? And what would be the landscape of thinking if we try to analyze in this way? Uh, that's to say the different concept of uh, uh, the different concept of technology and what would be the implication of understanding this multiplicity. I think if a multiplicity of nature is valid today, uh, it's, if, if it is convincing as what they're trying to do, then we cannot avoid the question of the multiplicity of technology that uh, in Europe it starts, for example, from Greeks to uh, the modern time. But as we know that uh, Europe and other parts of the world has very limited uh, uh, interactions in the you know before the 15th century, before the 15th, 16th century. So before that, what what are the what 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 were or what were the concept or how did the concept of technology look like, for example, uh, in this period during this period uh, in history, and how what is is what is um, the relations to thinking as such? For example, uh, Chinese thought, Japanese thought, uh, Amazonian thought, if there is such a thing. Uh, it's of course problematic to put nationality in front of thinking. If our premises are valid, then actually it, we cannot, 
we, we have to, to accept that actually there are a multiplicity, multiplicity of technological thinking. Today we didn't ask about this question is because of the process of modernization, well first of all colonization, and then uh, modernization is another form of colonization of course, colonization of knowledge and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that modernization is bad and so on, this is not my moral judgment, what I'm saying is that modernization uh, inevitably also implies a homogenization of, um, of, of, of knowledge, of world view and so on. And to the extent that today uh, we rarely question about um, the multiplicity of nature, you know, thanks to the anthropologist in the past 20 years, and then we, we start returning to this question. Uh, but we still didn't pay much attention to the question of technology. You know? we, we still uh, have the idea that uh, the impression that technology is universal because it's a rationality, because it's a logic, and so on. Uh, we, still, we, we, we still don't understand technology uh, in this sense. Uh, so for me, there is a need as a philosophical project to explore, first of all, the intimacy between philosophy and technology, and uh, that uh, Derrida, Stigler have been doing this, and I can see that more and more uh, younger generation of scholars are working on these questions. Uh, and also the, the, the multiplicity of technologies in different thinkings. Uh, with the, in different philosophical traditions. And in these different uh, philosophical traditions, we can also see that technological thinking has different relations to aesthetic thinking, philosophical thinking, uh, religious thinking, as Simon Don also trying to show. So this is my philosophical agenda, um, uh, so to speak.